Hello, welcome to the latest diorama build. This one was inspired by a painting I've been looking at for over 20 years now, and it's a painting by F.M. Bennett, an artist that lived a long time ago in the south of England. And I don't know what the painting is of for sure, but I suspect it's loosely based on the Mermaid Inn in Rye. This is a pub that still exists today and I have visited it. But anyway, I'm using the painting as inspiration for the building part of this diorama. In the painting there's a girl feeding pigeons and ducks, all very chocolate box sort of picture. But I'll be making the figures a little more mysterious. So, first thing to do is establish the base, so as usual a sheet of plywood and cover it in foam. In advance I've planned out the basic shapes of the building on a 3D program and from that I've got the measurements of the plan view and I've cut them out onto bits of paper so I can trace it onto the foam just so as I know where the blocks of foam I'm going to cut for the building core will go and I might carve some of the ground area in front of the building before I glue the building blocks in place. I haven't yet decided at what stage I'm going to glue it all together. As soon as it's glued in place, it's going to make modifying it anything or adding anything a little bit more awkward. So I'm going to leave joining the building to the base as late as I possibly can. I've bought a stack of random sized blocks of foam and they seem to have rounded off edges so I'm using my little homemade guide and foam cutter just to square everything off, give me a good base to start from. Using the little plan pieces as a guide I'm seeing how many blocks I have to glue together to make the basic building shapes. And then I'm trying out some construction cement to glue them together. Never used it before. See how it goes. All this block cutting has been greatly complicated by my decision to make the whole diorama slightly on the skew. I thought not having it square to the base would give it a bit more visual interest, which I still believe, but cutting everything with odd angles is tricky without your foam cutter being able to vary the angle of the wire like you can on the Proxon version. But that's what you get for being about four times the price. So you have to use what you got and there's always ways around things. After finishing the main blocks, I need to define the doors and windows, and these need to be cut into the foam. It was very easy for the window on the upper level, as I did that before gluing the whole sheet onto the main block, but the lower levels, I've got to try and excavate it somehow. Fortunately, the back of these holes will never get seen, so they can be very rough without a problem, but I will try and get them as flat as possible, just to make things easier. And now the bit I've been slightly dreading, trying to plan out and cut all the roof shapes. I'm going to use foam board for the main roof, which ultimately will have tiles glued to it. But I will have solid foam core to this. But I thought the best way to start is to shape a bit of foam board on the big long slope that faces you when you look at the diorama as a whole. I thought this area is key and everything can work back from that. And as the whole thing's going to get covered, I can use the convenience of skewers to hold it in place temporarily and ultimately I can just leave them in place once glued. Now I've got that first piece in place, I can start working backwards. I haven't glued the first piece to the foam yet, as I will need to fill in the cavity with foam at some point, and have it in place will make that much more difficult. Thank you. 
I am thinking it's a good idea to glue the two foam board pieces together. So I'm just using a little bit of PVA to do that job. I have now decided I'd better get the foam blocks in place for all the roofs as that will be a better guide for the foam board that goes over the top. And I'm really pleased I chose putting the whole thing on the skew as it's making the roof shapes really complicated and maybe I should have planned it all out on the computer first like I did on the creepy house building. Trying to eyeball it all in place and working it out as I go along is a struggle. One good part is all these foam blocks will ultimately be covered up by the foam board so I can be as rough as I like with no care to how the surface will ultimately look. With the main roof blocks in place, it should now be a much easier task of cutting the foam board roof ready for tiling. When using the construction cement, I found it still wasn't dry properly the next day. So I'm going back to my old favorite, Gorilla Glue, the foaming type. It really sticks foam very well. You just have to clamp it while drying because as the glue sets, it expands, pushing the parts apart if you're not careful. But it doesn't take much, either a little bit of weight or with this foam, you can jam skewers in, which I use quite a lot on this project as there's often a lack of flat surfaces to put weights. But all in all, after I'd put those foam blocks in place for the core of the roof, measuring and cutting the foam board into place was actually quite straightforward. And now you can get a real sense of what the whole thing's gonna look like. And now's a good time as any to stick the two halves together. The building is going to be timber framed and I thought I'd try balsa wood glued onto the foam to represent the timber frame. And when it's all glued on and in place, I'll think of something to fill in the gaps between the wooden planks. I've seen on other channels people using all sorts of things, plaster paris, various fillers, but that's a future me problem. I now just need to glue these planks into some sort of logical pack. I'm not following anything in particular, but it's got to make some sort of sense. And this part of the process is actually quite enjoyable. This little tiny metal square is proving extremely useful for this task. Here I'm just weighting down everything for about half an hour while the PVA mostly dries. Here I'm putting in place the rafters that are poking out supporting the upper floor and I've cut them all to length, added some glue to the whole thing and just stacking them up side by side and before the glue dries I take out every other one to give me a nice spacing. The balsa wood framing is a little too perfect so I'm using the scalpel to cut into the edges to give it a wavy edge and generally scratch the surface so when I do the paint washes and dry brushing this texture should show up. One downside of not really planning it is you make mistakes. And here I made the planks stroke beams go straight into the ground. Whereas I think there should be a horizontal beam for it all to sit on. But no matter, it's relatively simple to cut the bottom off and splice in a new horizontal. 
Halfway through putting all these balsa strips onto the foam, I got a delivery of some tacky glue. I'd never used this stuff before, and I did a quick little experiment, and it was definitely stronger than the PVA. So from now on, I'm using that. It's a lot more expensive, but for little jobs like this, the small pot I got will go a long way. I'm now making a little rustic door, so I've got a sheet of balsa, I'm just scoring some vertical plank lines, then I'll glue on some cross braces, and uh, that'll be enough. The two windows in this build, I'm going to make them separately as at some point I'm going to need to paint behind the windows and I will cover them with glazing and leaded lights so they will be one of the last things I'll end up adding and for ease of construction I'll be using super glue rather than having to wait ages for the PVA or tacky glue to dry. It's now time to break out the laser cutter as I want to use my favourite thing to cut, super thin stainless steel and I'm using it to cut the leaded lights. The laser does make the stainless steel come out a little crinkly, I'm sure that's due to the heat involved, but I found using a heavy roller I can get it back to perfectly flat with no distortion, so I'm very happy about that. The leaded lights can be cut very easily with some scissors, so I just have to trim them to the right size. And then using some spray mount, I glue them to a sheet of thin acetate, which also can be cut out quite easily. And I just try them up to the balsa window frames, but I won't glue it yet because I will paint some washes over the balsa first and glue the whole thing onto the building when that also has been painted first. About the only thing on this diorama that will have exposed foam is the little stone built outhouse attached to the main building. And it's a simple matter of scoring the stone lines into the foam. And I'm quite happy about the little chunk of foam that got there naturally. And it'll just look like the stone's been chipped. So happy accident. The last thing to add is a little dovecot which was in the original painting. I thought it a nice feature so I'm just going to freehand build one. If it was a real thing from the era I would imagine it was quite crudely built and it's just been made from odd scraps of balsa. Right, now the fun begins, tiling. On the creepy house diorama, apart from gluing all the tiles individually onto the roof, I had to cut them out individually as well. But this time, we have a laser cutter. I can't use the ABS sheets of plastic I used last time, as they give off nasty toxic fumes when burnt. So I've gone for construction card. I initially tried butting the tiles up to one another to maximize cardboard usage. They all pinged out, went into heaps and got jammed underneath the laser head. So I've put a little frame round to try and keep them in place and mostly worked. The odd one either fell through the metal grid below, which was fine. A few ended up laying across and got cut twice, but the failure rate was small enough to not matter. I had to do two sheets like this to get enough tiles for the whole roof, which I think worked out an estimated 1,500 tiles to do the whole thing, but at least I didn't have to cut them out individually myself. Right, this is taking far too long, so cue Benny Hill music, if only I was allowed to use it. Such a shame, I can't.
looking at all the footage of me sticking the tiles on it's taken me around eight hours just as well i like these sort of repetitive mindless tasks i think there must be something wrong with me i've been thinking for a while what to do about the gully and i thought the simplest thing was to get some milliput and pretend they've just put a strip of lead connecting the two roofs it stands out like a sore thumb at the moment but once painted dark and covered in moss and rubbish it should blend in okay now the whole roof gets a good coating of PVA glue to protect it. I thought I'd do some of the painting before I fill up between the balsa planks with plaster or whatever I'm going to use. And the standard practice is to paint things like the tiles in some what look like garish colours. But the reason for that is when you cover them with washes those colours get knocked right back so if you don't make them really strong they'll disappear altogether. The first wash pass is just a light bluey grey as I want the tiles to look a bit more slaty than clay. The second wash is general grime and this one will go on in patches and I will let the paint run down the roof as well. A quick dry brushing of white picks out all the edges of the tiles so it emphasises the fact that you have actually got individual tiles here rather than a flat painting. All the balsa wood areas are getting a black wash initially just to tone down the bright colour of the balsa wood and make it look more like weathered oak that's gone a bit silvery. Then I'll do subsequent washes with a little bit of brown and sometimes green just to do little spots of that here and there to stop the whole thing looking a uniform colour. Real life is always patchy. The little stone outbuilding gets a similar treatment to the tiles, painting the stones in different colours. And now is a good time to glue the windows in. I carefully cover all the stones in tile grout, carefully pushing the grout into all the cracks between the individual stones. I'm happy for some of the grout to stay on the face of the stones as that adds to the texture and does a similar job to a paint wash and knocks back the garish colours I've put underneath. I now flood the area with diluted isopropyl alcohol. The water should activate the tile grout and make it solidify and the alcohol breaks the surface tension. I still cover the whole thing in tons of diluted 50-50 water and PVA glue just to really make sure nothing's gonna move. I finally made the decision to fill in the gaps between the balsa planks with polyfiller. Good old fashioned polyfiller. I've known this stuff for about 40 odd years, although I assume it's changed a bit since then. I didn't go for the plaster, which I'm sure would work well, because I thought I'd make a colossal mess. And as you see, when I started with the polyfiller, I was being really careful, but that went out the window and I just slapped it on and scraped it and fix up the overspill later. I waited overnight for the polyflower to thoroughly dry, then I just cleaned up the overspill on the balsa by painting a wash over the whole thing. Unfortunately, the wash going over the stray bits of polyflower matched exactly to the wood. I did think I was going to have to painstakingly get all traces of the polyflower off the balsa, but had no effect, so job done. Future me, was I really saying polyflower? I meant polyfiller. 
Right, it's time to glue the building to the base, but just before I do that, I'm going to use a brass brush and some sandpaper just to give the land area some shape and give a hint of cart tracks. For the surface of the ground, I'm going to first cover the foam in a thick layer of neat PVA. And while it's still wet, cover it with a mixture of chinchilla sand and tile grout, my favorite base lumpy texture, and then leave it to thoroughly dry. Because the PVA is white and the tile grout is white, it's impossible to see the bits you've missed, so it's gonna take multiple goes. On this second pass, along with the tile grout and chichilla sand, I'm going to add broken shards of plaster of Paris from a previous project, and odd little stones and sticks. And when I've got a decent amount in place, making sure to scoot it all up where the building meets the ground, because you definitely don't want the slightest hint of a gap there. I cover the whole thing in dilute PVA to completely solidify it. Another overnight wait and I can paint a base ground colour and when that's dried the magic white dry brushing which catches all the little lumps and bumps and stones and brings the whole thing to life plus the odd little dark washing places here and there. Very simple, takes no effort. And now to add some moss, I'm putting spots of PVA all over the roof and then using some Jarvis Countryside Scenics light green coarse grass and sprinkling it all over the roof plus larger patches on the ground. And all you have to do then is wait for it to dry then you can shake the excess off where it hit places where there was no glue. I'm adding one weed tree and I've added the same coarse grass as the moss and sprinkled it over some sea foam little fake branches things just to add a little bit of extra interest to the scene. And now for the figure painting montage. I don't go into any great detail here or any at all as there's loads of dedicated figure painting channels out there and you'd be much better off learning how to do it from them. They're way better than me and seem to be able to film it properly as well. The figures already have a little wire glued to the base so I make use of that and drill holes in the Dorama base to locate the figures and securely hold them in place. A little bit of debris in the corner and it's all done. Well that's uh, another diorama done. It took a while. I do hope you enjoyed it and I would be very interested to know what sort of dioramas you'd like me to build in the future. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.